Good morning. Good morning. I think, I think we've sensed this morning, you guys might need to hear things maybe a couple of times before it to hit home. <clears throat> Almost 600 pairs of shoes. That's what we were able to raise money to purchase this, this next year. In dollar terms, that's, that's over $8,000. That's the largest offering we've taken up at CWC for VBS. And what will happen is in the coming year, we will have missionaries who will leave from this place, people of our congregation, and they will head out across the world, South America to Africa, and they'll take these shoes with them, as many as they can carry. And they're gonna walk into those places with a very practical gift that allows them then a place into that family's life to share the gospel. And scripture says, beautiful are feet. Now, I struggle with that one because I'm, I'm not a big foot guy, okay? But what makes those feet really beautiful is when they carry the gospel. And so those shoes will become priceless shoes as they are put onto kids' feet, onto adults' feet, and they're able to walk and are given a gospel presentation. So, kids, if you're that I hear this one, I keep forgetting we don't have children in the service, necessarily, but we have VBS workers. So, um, one more time, let's give them a round of applause for what, what they did this week to do practical ministry. So um, last week, I talked about the space-time continuum, and I said that, that Perryton is a, a place of fast movement. It doesn't take you very long to get from point A to point B, and you can get so much more done. I experienced that again yesterday. went to Amarillo, and what you know, it says on the thing, how many miles it takes, does not equate into minutes. It's so much quicker to get there. In D.C., it's a very slow life. It's a very easy to kick back, relax, to sit down for a while as you wait in traffic because it just never ends. And so I talked about this week, but I actually, I, I misspoke. And I need to help you to understand what the mistake I made. Because I really haven't, I mean, even with the traffic in downtown, and, and don't get people started on that topic of conversation, because I know it's a sore subject, but it only takes another maybe two minutes to get through downtown. It's just kind of crazy as you drive through, through cones. But there was a thing this past week that I experienced that was like traffic in D.C. Now, I've waited for a lot of things in my lifetime. Um, there was a moment where I had to wait a few minutes as, I, I, as my wife, my future wife, was about to come meet me at the altar. And that seemed like forever waiting, okay? I was waiting for my children to be born. Um, I've waited for, for restroom breaks. I've waited for, for food and lines. But there was something that happened this week that made this town become more like D.C. In, in, in a way. And it was when I was given a picture. My sister-in-law, who is a God-fearing woman, and she is just a caring person, but she sent me a picture and it just, it shocked me to no end that Perryton would allow this to happen. There were five rows of cars that were a football length each row. And they were just stacked upon each other. And they were just sitting there. It was like a traffic jam. And I couldn't believe it. And I thought, what, what are we doing here in Perryton that would cause us to have that kind of traffic? Why would the city has to do something about this? We've got to have the, the police officers need to be out there. We should have the Texas Rangers come in and, and usher this out. This is unacceptable. Until I took a bite of something and I realized <laughs> that it was worth the wait. <laughs> right? Now, if you, have not, if you have not gone to the Expo Center, too late. <laughs> They're gone. Okay? But these Colorado peaches... And um, you need to know how much restraint it's taking me not to just take a bite. But you guys know, I know if I take a bite, my, my shirt's going to be ruined. For I'll wait till after the service before I actually bite into something. But if you're from Perryton, you know that I think twice a year there is this traffic jam that happens at the Expo Center for Colorado Peaches. And, and it blew me away. I just didn't understand, but, but now I do, I, and I love them. They're good. Teresa, thank you very much. Teresa Snell sent us a, a Facebook message. It, whatever you're doing today, put it on hold. Head to the Expo Center. And, and I had to work through the network, but thankfully, my sister-in-law, again, who is a God-fearing woman who takes care of your pastor, got us two boxes of peaches, and we're going to be enjoying those and on pancakes, at meals. That will be breakfast. And it's going to be, right now, we've got some. It's, it's a good place. Perryton is a good place to live, Right? Yeah, you can give it a round of applause. That's all right. So welcome home. So at our house, there was this um, bowl on the table that now has these peaches. And that, that smell kind of wafts through the air. You walk into the house and you, you just know it's there, right? And so you, one of the things I do is to drop my backpack, which I use as a briefcase, and I head to the table. This is, I'm going to grab one of these. 
And, and for us as a family, that table thing has become very central to who we are and what we do as a family. Now, I'm going to take you back a few years. Um, when I was a kid, I, I've mentioned to some of you that my grandmother lived in Pampa. My dad grew up there. I think from like third grade on, he, he lived in Pampa with his two brothers. And there was a season when um, my grandmother was working 10, 12, 14-hour days with WPA. Um, and she was you know, washing laundry, cleaning houses to make ends meet in the Great Depression. And so that meant that these three boys were kind of on their own. Now, I'm going to bring that back up in a second. But in Pampa, we would come visit. And so Thanksgivings, we would drive. My dad would get off work. We'd load the car up. And we would take off. And we would get home to her house um, probably close to midnight. And every time we would come visit, there were three things that, that would happen. One, there would be a hug. And my grandmother was not a small, petite woman. She was about six foot one, weighed about 250 pounds, and that's a lot of love. <laughs> and when she was with her twin sister, that was a lot of love, <laughs> okay? And they were identical. So there was always a hug. There was always a kiss. And at the table, there was always a bowl of fresh, warm banana pudding with, with vanilla wafers and, and a pitcher of sweet iced tea. If you came at 2 in the afternoon, if we arrived at midnight, if we arrived the next morning at 6 a.m., that was going to be on the table, and my grandmother would be at the table waiting for us. And as soon as the door would open, she would stand up and, and come. And that table became a very precious thing for me as a kid. Now, I don't know if, how many of you may still have this, so I'm not being disrespectful, but she had one of those Formica tables that looked like marble granite, but it wasn't. And it had the, the chrome rim around the outside. And had the chrome pedestal legs that came down, and she had the matching chairs that were vinyl. Okay? Not, not priceless furniture, but that was a priceless place. And for a kid to sit around the table, my grandmother would ask me questions. How is school? How are sports? How are things going? You got any new friends? What are, what are, what's happening with you? And this was a table place that became something that was priceless for me. And, and my wife has done a, a wonderful job in our own house to make the table a place where our family happens. We're busy just like you guys are, and this past week has been really hard for us because one of the things we try to do is to have at least one meal sitting at the table. And sometimes, you know, our kids are getting off to school early. They're out of the house by 6.55, 7 o'clock to get to school. We don't really do early breakfast. We don't see them during the day for lunch, and so dinner time becomes the place where we gather around, and there's just a few things we do to check the pulse. How was school today? How are you doing? You have a game coming up. Are you ready for that? And there's just these conversation pieces that take place. And, and sometimes there are discipline things that happen at the table. Now, that's where I talk about my dad. So being on his own for two, three, four years, they were like feral cats running around the neighborhood. I mean, they're throwing rocks at each other. If they got a hold of 22s, they would shoot each other with 22s and BB guns. I don't know how I was born. I'm surprised my dad survived. But at the table, when my grandmother remarried a man, he was high character. And he, and he loved my, my dad and his two brothers in such a way that he said, when you come to the table, there's a certain way we behave. And so through the process of gentle instruction, he began to teach them how to be young men coming to the table. And my dad would tell stories that if they ever put their elbows on the table, or if they began to reach for something without asking for permission, or if they began to eat before prayer or before a conversation would happen, then he would take his finger and he would pop them on top of the head. And, and of course, they're not watching, right? If they're getting a, a thump on the head, they're too busy eating, but he would correct. But there was a caveat to it. If he ever broke a rule at the table, then guess what they got to do? They got to thump him also. Now you take you know, a seven-year-old little boy trying to thump a grown man. It was more of a symbolic gesture. So the, the table isn't always a place of jokes and, and funny stories. Sometimes it's a place of, of discipline. Sometimes it's a place of heartache. But when you come to the table, one of the things you never find are salespeople, right? In our home, we don't have somebody who comes to the door and knocks the door. We don't say to the salesperson, oh, come in, come to my table. Let me serve you something to eat. We keep them on the porch. We want to keep them outside the house if at all possible, even if you know them, right? Okay, are you here to sell me something or are you here to drink some sweet tea with me? I'm here to sell you a policy. Okay, let's step outside the house for a second. What do you, you know, you've got 30 seconds, go, okay? There are some people who never make it to the table. Sometimes they make it to the entryway, maybe to the, the receiving room, 
but they don't make it to the table. When you make it to the table, you know you're part of what? Family. <clears throat> How many of you can think back to your, your family events, Thanksgivings and Christmas, Easter's? And, and you ran out of a table space, and so you began to use card tables, and you began to use anything that would stand on four legs just so you could put plates, and you had the adult room, and you had the children's room, and, and, and everybody was eating in, certain, in places that you would never serve food except for that one time a year. The table is a place where family is found. Now, why are we talking about the table? You see, there's a thing that happens at the table called Fellowship. I want to take us back to Old Testament for a second because I'm going to draw some imagery to this idea of a table fellowship. If you have your scriptures open to the Song of Songs, the Song of Solomon, it's the same book, Old Testament. We're looking specifically at, at chapter 2. We're going to go verses 3 and 4. Now, if, if you've ever read through the Song of Solomon, don't get excited. We're not going to go through all the imagery this morning. Okay, we're going to stick with these two particular verses. But I want us to see this beautiful imagery that comes up when the author talks about what it means to have true fellowship. Now, the imagery that they will use will be things of fruit trees. They'll talk about um, the ideas of a, of a hall, of a banquet place. But what we want to see is what is going on in the fellowship in the moment. Now, the, the history behind this book is it's kind of written as a, a romantic um, piece of literature. You have a man who's pursuing a woman, and there's a lot of intense, romantic conversation. They describe each other in very passionate terms, the things of how they see and the things that, of, of their life that will be together, but they're not quite there yet. And then we come into chapter 2, and, and there's a statement made about the character of the man who's pursuing the woman. And that's what I want to look at this morning. So here we have it. Follow along with me. We're looking at Song of Solomon chapter 2. We're starting in verse 3, and this is what it writes. Like an apple tree... Among the trees of the forest is my beloved among the young men. I delight to sit in his shade, and his fruit is sweet to my taste. Let him lead me to the banquet hall, and let his banner over me be love. In this passage, we see two things when it comes to fellowship. First of all, in verse 3, she begins to describe him as a tree. Doesn't happen that often. So it's kind of a quirky thing. But let me help you understand what this tree symbolizes, right? We have a man who is providing in the moment. If you think about a tree, okay, and we got some guys who spend days, long days in hot areas where there is no shade. When you find a tree in the middle of the day and you can take a break from the sun, you get that, that relief from, from that heat beating down on you. And so this apple tree provides shade and, and, and it's something that provides this relief. You're able to kind of recover in the shade of the tree. And so this is how she's describing him. He is providing. She describes him as an apple tree, which then talks about you know, fruit that can provide life. And so all these things she's describing are the things that she's receiving from him as she steps into this moment. But what she's really describing is there's presence. She is with him in this moment, and he is with her. So they are together. And I want you to understand when it comes to the table of fellowship, presence is of vital interest and importance. I can see a tree across the horizon. And, and as you come from Amarillo, you can see a lot of trees in the distance, little, little pockets here and there near water. But I don't get to enjoy those trees because I'm not there in the presence of a tree. She's talking about I am with him and he is with me. And what he provides for me is life-giving. Here's another part. If you ever sat below a tree and the grass is cool and soft and you lean up against the tree to find rest and maybe you take a nap, it's because she's there. We need to understand that as we approach the table of fellowship, God is calling us into presence, into relationship. I have family members that I've known my entire life that have never been at my table and I've never been at their table. There's a break in that relationship. I don't know them that well. And so when it comes to this fellowship thing, the idea of presence has to be engaged. 
We cannot worship a God and think he only exists in this building on a Sunday morning. And we walk away from here, we walk away from him. He is calling us into presence. That's not accurate theology. God is in all places at all times. He is what they say, omnipresent. You can't escape him. The darkest place on the planet, he's there fully. There aren't degrees of his presence. And so the, the ability we have to come to a fellowship moment with him is not because we have some skilled capability to make things happen. It's because he invites us in. And so this imagery begins to kind of point us to something greater than just a king who's in a romantic relationship. It's a hint of something greater that is intended for us. Now, another thing we realize in this is that along with presence, we also see belonging. In verse 4, as it begins to describe this relationship, it goes from sitting under a tree to then going into some place. They walk in together and it says, let him lead me into the banquet hall and let his banner over me be love. Now, let me just kind of describe this for a moment because I want you to see why this is important. The issue with this is the fact that when they come to the banquet hall, this is a place where celebration would take place. Let him lead me there. They're walking together. So presence is already engaged, but now they're coming into some place together and something's going to happen. When you walk into a banquet hall, <clears throat> there would be a large table. And there would be places for people to sit. Guests would sit in order of importance. Jesus kind of gave this command, don't go to the head of the table, but sit in a place of less honor so that if the master of the house comes in and invites you to sit next to him, everyone sees the honor that you have. But how embarrassed would you be if you sat at the head of the table and the king walked in and said, you need to move down there because I have somebody more important. And now you're walking in shame. So there's a, there's a progression in importance. And if you've ever been to a wedding, you kind of know your place, right? The wedding party gets to sit at the place of honor. The, the marriage couple are at the head of the table. People serve them. They celebrate them. I'm over here at the far side table over in the corner with people I don't even know. No one serves me anything. No one brings me a glass of iced tea and says, we hope you're enjoying this until the, maybe the wedding party comes around. I'm not the focal point. But in walking her into this banquet hall, what he's saying is, she's with me. We belong to each other. Now, that doesn't happen if presence isn't there, but once presence is established, then we begin to walk into a place of belonging. I get to sit at the table with a person who is the focal point. Now, there have probably been some moments of mistake where I have misunderstood my place. I, I, I'm not a huge fan of attending weddings. I mean, they're fun and all, but... You, know, you kind of want to do it and get on with business, okay, and eat a little snack food and move on, okay? But in doing weddings and, and officiating, there was a, a moment in time where I kind of thought, well, maybe they've got a place for me next to the wedding couple because I'm, I'm, I'm the pastor, right? I, I need to be fed sweet tea, and somebody needs to attend to my needs. And so first couple of weddings that there was this reception, I would walk into the place, and I'm looking for name tags at the head table, and there's no place that says most high reverend. <laughs> well, where's that at? Right? And then it's like, okay, I think I found my name, but they, they don't have all their correct titles. Most beloved person on the face of the planet, Kevin Britton, and his beautiful wife. And so then sometimes I don't even have a name tag. But here, because she belongs to the king, there is a place for her at the seat of honor. She's brought to the table. So presence and belonging are huge. But this, again, is just a hint, right? I don't live in <clears throat> this period of time where we even have castles and banquet halls, really. Um, I, I, I've been by Brian's Corner. There's not really a banquet hall there. Am I right? Okay, I think there's like a restaurant in Brian's Corner, and there probably is a, a place of honor next to the, where the cook is so your food is hotter. I'm going to share a really quirky story with you. And it has to do with this thing about knowing where you sit and, and knowing the appropriate place. I have a very good friend who now is a pastor in Australia. And um, when I first moved to Virginia, he was my education pastor. So he was the guy who was my supervisor. 
And we were similar in height, we were similar in look, we were kind of similar in personalities, although he was much weirder than I am in my assessment. So one day, um, he takes me for lunch. And every time he said, hey, I'll take you out to lunch, what that meant was, we're going to go Dutch. You're going to pay for yourself. He was kind of a cheap skate that way. So um, we get to this place called Famous Dave's, and in the restaurant, there's this little corner table, and it literally is in the corner. There is just enough room for two people to barely sit, and above it is on, this, on the wall that says, worst house or worst table in the house. And they're not lying. It is literally the worst table in the house. For two big guys who are weighing 250 pounds plus, it's like trying to sit in a Volkswagen and eat Sonic. You just, there's not enough elbow space. I can't, I can't make room. So we're sitting there, and I'm like, why did you bring me? He said, because if you sit here for lunch, half price meal, and a free dessert. Boy, this is now the best seat in the house. Okay? So we order the biggest platter of barbecue that you can get. It's called the All American Feast, and by itself is like $60. Well, now it's $30. And we're going to split it, so now it's $15, and I'm going to get free dessert out of this. And it's more than I can eat. It's like a trash can lid, and it's just full. It literally is a trash can lid, but it's not been pulled out of the back trash. It's clean. But it's just filled with briskets and rib and chicken and sausage and, and sweet corn muffins. And it's just there, and we're sitting at the table. We're having this conversation. We enjoy this meal. Two weeks later, he comes in the office. He had been in a conference down in Richmond. He said, you won't believe what happened. I said, what? He goes, I found a new worst seat in the house at a different famous Dave's. And I was like, yeah, what happened? He goes, well, I went to the restaurant and I said, hey, it's lunchtime. I would like to be seated at the worst table in the house. And they were like, okay, well, we don't have a lot of servers. There's some stuff. He goes, doesn't matter. I want the worst table in the house. And I said, okay. So they checked with the manager. Manager gave thumbs up. They escorted him through the entire restaurant. There was probably maybe five people there. And he keeps looking for that corner table. And they take him around around the corner, and there's this guy sitting there, and he's putting together silverware, who looks at him and says, hey, and he's next to the bathrooms. She kind of had that bathroom smell coming out, and they set him at a booth. And no, one, no one attended to his needs. They finally, after 15 minutes, came over, they took his order, and then 30 minutes later, he got half of his order that was kind of cold, and he's just really confused. And so the manager came over and said, sir, we've been talking in the back. Why are you here? And he goes, because I want to sit at the worst table of the house and get my meal half price. And the guy's like, oh, yeah, we don't do that here. <laughs> that is only the restaurant. In, are you from Woodbridge? Yeah. He goes, yeah, that's only that restaurant. It's a quirky deal. But you got literally the worst house next to the bathroom with no service. We thought you just kind of were doing something like you got problems. And he's sitting there. So he paid $50 for a full meal with no service next to the bathroom. If you don't understand how the table works, we get confused. It doesn't make sense to us. How is it possible that someone who is a sinner, who's rebellious, could come sit at a beautiful table? Why would the king invite me to come be with him when I haven't even acknowledged that king? But yet God continues over and over again to come after us because he has set a place for us at his table. Not because of who I am. I'm not an ambassador from an important place. It's because of who he is and his love for me. Let me say that again. I have a place at the table because of who he is and his love for me. And if you have a seat at the table today, it's because of Jesus Christ. How many of you have a seat at the table? How many of you are wondering... What are you talking about? Are we going to smokehouse after church? What? I don't understand the table you're talking about. You see, your, your, your place is there. The, the forks and knives and spoons are in their correct order. There's the beautiful table setting of peaches that are about to be eaten, literally. There's a name card. Right here it says your name. And the beautiful part is you don't really have to understand why it's there. You just have to accept the invitation. But over and over again, <clears throat> I am convicted that too many times I want to kick the table over in my ignorance. I, I want to put things on the plate that don't belong there because I don't understand. You see, as a sinful person, I want to disrupt this. I want to set my own table. My sin causes me to be rebellious against this. How arrogant it is of God to say that he has a place for me and wants to forgive me of my sins. Who is he? 
And God in his grace and mercy is very patient. He sets the table back up. He puts the plate in its proper place. He gets a nice clean napkin for you. He puts the, the knife and the spoon and the fork in its proper place. He resets the table setting and again says, come, come eat with me. Come be with me. When she says the banner over me at the banquet table is a banner of love, she's talking about the character of the person who is the king. And oftentimes kings would put things in place that it would say, I'm a fierce lion. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a fearsome bird of prey that will come and kill you. I'm a king who can't be defeated. And those things would go into battle and it would show the world, this is who I fight for. And yet what's described in this is this banner of love that defeats all fear, that conquers every kingdom, that robs man of every hate and every ill feeling. And it takes a world of chaos and that love brings in a moment of peace. You see, when you go home today and you eat lunch, wherever you have lunch at and whoever you sit down with, what you're looking at is peace. Not because it's calm. Sometimes this is the craziest place in the house. You know, plates are passing. And, and all of a sudden, somebody passes the plate in the wrong direction. Right? The chaos breaks out. Food, we've got to put everything on hold and make sure we understand the etiquette and protocol for eating lunch at the house. Right? But here it is. And love is the banner that sets the standard. That his character over us is love that draws us in. But the hint is fulfilled in the moment when Jesus Christ is brought into play. You see, we approached the table this morning, and this is the table of fellowship. And we came in this morning, and we walked up, and somebody greeted us, and they gave us a handshake or a hug, and they invited us to, to take and eat and drink. And so what was hinted to in the romance of Song of Solomon was fulfilled in the life of Jesus Christ. The banner of love was Jesus Christ hanging on the cross for us. That's a powerful banner. The table that was set was set for us to find peace through the body and blood of Christ. Paul puts it this way. In 1 Corinthians, he writes in, in chapter 10, verses 15 through 17. You can read it up here with me. It says, I speak to sensible people. I'm sure he was talking to you. Judge for yourselves what I say. Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread that we break in participation with the body of Christ because there is only one loaf? We who are many are one body, for we all share that one loaf. The table fellowship found its fulfillment in Jesus Christ. Church, I would say this in two ways. As you walk out of here today and as you sit at your table and you eat a meal, I want you to think in two things. One, does my family reflect to the world that there is peace at my table? Not quietness, not calmness. It may be a busy place. It may be a moment of sharing funny stories. There may be love expressed. There may be times of thumping and correction. There may be times of silence. But we are a family. It's a place where we gather. As my dad was disciplined as a kid, it never drove him from the table, but allowed him to come back to the table and be part of the family. Here's a bigger picture. And, and, and I'm going to have to say to the online community, you're going to have to just hold on for a second. But if we evaluate ourselves here at CWC Perryton, are we a people who come to the table and eat in peace? Or do we have conflict and chaos at our table because we are not eating from one bread? We are not together. We are not walking this life supporting and encouraging each other. The world out here hears that there is a problem. They know the stories about us. And, and I, I have to say that now because I'm drawn into this community, like it or not. And whatever problems have been here, whatever celebrations have been here, I'm part of the storyline now. And I would say as a church, we have to evaluate. Are we a church that comes to the table of peace? Or are we pushing people away because it's a table of chaos? And I can't answer that today. And nor will I answer it for you. 
And my encouragement is to go away from here. And I will tell you the complexity of this is, is, is true. This is an incredible place. You guys are in amazing people. And over and over again, I get to have conversations about the things that you're doing, how you're serving, how you truly care for people. So please hear this in accuracy. There's a lot of great things about this place. Or, or else we wouldn't be here. But I also know that that what's at the table isn't necessarily drawing everybody in because there's some conflict going on. When Jesus prayed, the high priestly prayer in John 17, he gave us this indicator of how effective we would be in sharing the world that God was real. And it was a three-part relationship that Jesus was with God and God was with him and that the two of them were within us and we were in them. And this three-part relationship existed so well and we were so shaped by it that we sat at the table with no problems. And the world looked at us and said, I don't understand what you're doing. I don't understand how you live this life. And it proved to them that what they had was chaos and it was ripping them apart. But because we had Christ living in us and Christ was living in God and God was living amongst in this three-part relationship, it was a word to the world that God is real and he is a God of consequence. So I want us to be happy. I want us to be able to hold hands and, and tell funny stories. One of the things I love about Perryton is you meet somebody, you're about to get a sarcastic comment and then a little bit of a laugh. And then you can shoot back with some sarcasm and it's all good, shake hands and go on your way. You do that in D.C. and it's, you got problems. People, Wisconsin's just don't get sarcasm as like we do. But more than us simply being happy, is I want us to be holy. I want us to be set apart, used by God for his purposes to redeem this city. And I tell you this, and this is a, a truth that you can take to the bank. If God can reconcile the relationships in CWC, he's going to change Perryton for his purposes. If God can reconcile the issues that are at CWC with people who love each other, which have some deep issues then he's going to reconcile Perryton better than any VBS will, better than any Easter egg hunt will, better than any Christmas presentation will. I don't care if you dress up on Main Street down at the park and you're in full shepherd regalia with live animals. I'm not against those things, but you watch reconciliation within the church and it'll change a city. It will proclaim to them in a way we never could before that God is real, that God loves them, and God wants them to come sit at his table with him. So go home today. Check that pulse. Who are you inviting to your table? My one last word to you. The people who sit across from you at this place setting won't always be beautiful people. I'm not saying because of age or physical damage. But God calls us to invite the unlovelies to come sit with us at the table. They get things a little bit messy. And that's okay. Just as God invited me to his table, and I made things a little bit messy. He can powerfully change the people who come to the table. Let's pray. Father, we are thankful that through this story of romance that you gave us this glimpse of what it meant to, to live in peace, this table that changes lives. And that there's this sense of, uh, of belonging. There's a sense of presence. And Father, at the very core of who we are, we crave for those things. It is the very nature of who you are. You exist in the three parts. And so when you created us, that, that DNA, it rubbed off and we were created craving fellowship. And that's why you looked at us and as we were sitting there, we were dwelling with a, a spiritual God, we were physical, you looked and said, it's not good for man to be alone and created woman. And, and we have this desire that goes deeper than we fully understand to be in relationship. And so then you gave this image of walking into a banquet hall, a place of celebration. And we are walking with you and you brought presence and you brought belonging. And Father, that helps us understand peace. 
but then praise your name that you then sent Jesus Christ to fulfill that image in perfection. And it's through Jesus Christ and his sacrifice on the cross that helped us to understand what the banner of love really meant. And it's Jesus Christ and his sacrifice that helped us to understand what it means to come sit at the table and what it took for us to be part of that meal and that fellowship and that celebration. And so, Father, send us away from this place. And I pray that each one of us walk into our homes, we walk into a restaurant, it doesn't matter if it's McDonald's or it's the, a five-star restaurant in, in Dallas, that when we sit down, we understand that the table means so much more than just a piece of wood to sit at and eat. It is a place where we can begin to change our neighborhoods because we invite people to come into our home and experience what it means to be part of a family that loves Jesus. We have to tolerate a lot of things, Father, so empower us. We have to think creatively about what meals to have and how to, how to serve. So empower us, Father. Teach us. And if some of us are here this morning, Father, you know their hearts. and They're not living in a relationship. They've not come to sit at the table. And that's where it begins. And so, Father, this morning, thank you for sharing this idea with us and letting us celebrate the relationship that we have with you through your son. I'm going to ask our prayer team to come down to the front. I'll be honest with you, there are some days that the, that the Britain Table House isn't really a place of, of nurturing. Sometimes it gets away from us. Sometimes we act out of the flesh. And you may have been sitting here this morning thinking back to a moment where the table that you sat at as a child, or maybe even as a young adult, or maybe even as an adult, was a destructive place. And you want to come and lay that at the altar and say, that's not my table anymore. Jesus Christ has provided me a table of love and care. Maybe I've been the one, and, and, and dads, I'll speak to you personally. Maybe I'm the one who sat at this table, and I was the agent of chaos and destruction because I was living out of my own means. And maybe you need to come confess that this morning. That as a father, I did not create a table to serve my family to show them who Jesus Christ looked like. But I showed him Kevin Britton, and that's pretty ugly. Moms, maybe it's not about how well the table was set, how fine your linen is. Maybe you don't have the right plates. That's not what I'm worried about. But maybe you were so concerned about everything being perfection that you didn't allow people to come to the table. Maybe that's a place of confession this morning. And let God take that from you. Because I will tell you this. I've been at some very perfect tables that were cold. And I've been at some very ugly picnic tables that had some gross stains on them, and they were some of the best meals I ever ate. So maybe you need to come this morning and confess those things and ask God to teach us. How do we invite people to our table? If you're here this morning and you don't know that you have a place at the table, come. I guarantee you these people down front will show you how, to, how the reservation's already made. You just got to go and, and, and cash in on it. The table is a powerful place. I encourage you to come this morning and spend some time in prayer with these people in the front. Pray with each other in your chairs, but respond to what God has shown you. Let's stand together in this moment of decision and response. And as God leads you, you come.